Okay, good morning everyone. Glad to be here with you today, even though it's virtual, made parking a lot easier this morning. But so uh, my talk is gonna be on abdominal radiographs. Radiologists love talking about x-rays, especially abdominal x-rays, because we are just constantly doing them every day, all day. Um, vomiting is very common. Uh, and I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. Um, everyone has x-rays generally widely available. Uh, it's going to be less expensive than other modalities that you might choose. Uh, ultrasound, CT, and even when we have these available, a lot of times we still use abdominal radiographs as a first line imaging diagnostic. And generally you're performing these without sedation. Uh, certainly a little sedation doesn't hurt in most cases, but what are the common indications? Well, everything. Um, vomiting, anorexia, diarrhea, very common. Any sort of lab work abnormalities that you might be experiencing. Uh, abdominal pain, abdominal distension, palpable mass, fever, urinary signs, weight loss. Basically, any sort of screening for a uh, clinical sign or a lab work abnormality you might have, abdominal radiographs are often going to be in the picture. So I put in a couple things about technique uh, just because it's kind of nice to get back and realize like why some technique charts do what they do. Uh, usually if you have a vomiting patient, there's no preparation required. You're just going to take the radiographs. Although knowing the history about when a patient was fed is always really important because that takes into account how much ingested am I expecting in the stomach. Uh, if it's something that just ate, you're going to expect a lot of gas stippled, kibbly looking food. Uh, if it's been eight hours, then you're going to interpret stuff in the stomach a lot more carefully. And the abdomen is inherently low contrast. So in the thorax, it's high contrast. You have gas and soft tissues. Abdomen is low contrast because you have mostly soft tissue fluid and then the peritoneal fat. So we're going to do our best to increase contrast in the belly. So that uses a low KVP, because KVP is where you're gonna get your shades of gray. So the higher the KVP, the more crayons in your coloring box, and so you're gonna have uh, a lot more kind of uh, spectrum of stuff. Low KVP, only three crayons, so it's gonna be much more contrasty, and we counteract that with a higher MAS. And collimation, so a lot of times emergency or you know, they want the most information they can get from a study, so they do the chabdomen. Uh, but just realize that the, the bigger your field of view, the more scatter in the patient, and then the less detail that you have. So if you do, if you see radiographs where they do thorax and abdomen, and then they take just abdomen in that same case, there's much better source of detail in the collimated series. Um, so that's important when you're trying to follow the intestines look for foreign material, or interpret serosal detail, especially in big dogs when it's already kind of crappy. And user grid when available for abdomen. So orthogonal views, the left lateral and VD views are the minimum requirement for abdominal x-rays, especially with vomiting. But take the three views, left and right lateral, and then you're gonna get your most information that you can because you get shifting gas and fluid. It's gonna highlight things that you didn't see the first time. So we routinely take three view abdomen series and I am much happier for it. So why the left lateral? I know a lot of places that their abdomen series would routinely be a right lateral and a VD. And um, there's a couple of reasons why I think this is uh, the case is because uh, I've seen technicians, you know, when you take a right lateral radiograph, usually the feet are towards you. It's easier to restrain the animal. Um, I think a lot of people are just like right lateral GDV. So they always want to get that right lateral in there, but just use the right lateral and VD as their abdominal series. But for vomiting cases, especially, you're not seeing the pylorus and duodenum like you need to on right lateral views, and you're going to miss a lot of disease there. So this is from Thrall. Uh, so the right lateral view, the, the gray is the fluid. So you're gonna see, uh, no, I'm sorry, the, the, the F is the fluid. So the right lateral, you're gonna, 
so excuse me, the right lateral is uh, fluid going into the pylorus, and that's what's going to look like a foreign body or a tumor. Uh, so a lot of like young veterinarians think that they have a mass or a, a ball foreign body, but it's just a right lateral view where fluid is naturally going into the pylorus. When you do the left lateral view, now you have gas going up into the pylorus, and now you could see if there was foreign material causing outflow obstruction, now it's highlighted by gas, and that's what you really want. So why do we care about left laterals so much? Why do we want to see uh, pylorus and duodenum? Well, about a quarter of cases of obstructive foreign bodies are in the duodenum. So if it's fluid filled, then you're gonna have fluid possibly silhouetting with something soft tissue. Uh, in the case of linear foreign bodies, as high as 84% involve the duodenum. So you're going to miss a lot of cases of subtle plication if you don't have gas in the duodenum to kind of give you that teardroppy shape or that irregular plicated shape. And uh, you'll see today in a couple of cases why pylorus is important for uh, identifying outflow obstructions. So just a little step back of like, what's my approach to uh, radiographs? I tend to be redundant because I wanna be very thorough. So when I open a study, the first thing I do is I look all the way around the image in the periphery, looking for anything miscellaneous. Uh, then I will hone in on the area of interest because once you find something in the area of interest of why you took the radiograph, you're more likely to have satisfaction of search. So now we look in the belly. Uh, be thorough and systematic. I notice that I tend to take a systems approach primarily when I'm looking at radiographs. So I'll look at hepatobiliary and then I'll look at GI tract, stomach, colon, small intestines. Then I tend to do renal, retroperitoneal, spleen, uh, cirrhosis of detail. Um, inherently, you're kind of doing a little bit of both. So you're doing a um, you know, geographic approach as well as systematic and then just pattern recognition. But I tend to kind of think in systems primarily. And then before you close the study, before I sign a report, I tend to do another swing around and just make sure I'm not missing a pulmonary nodule or soft foreign body or lytic bone lesion. Um, stuff that necessarily you weren't expecting, but is very important. So my approach to vomiting. So one of the number one things that you need to do in these cases is identify colon. And so that's gonna require that abdominal radiographs go at least to the coxephemeral joints. And then you're gonna be able to follow colon into the pelvic inlet. And then you know that, okay, colon's connected to rectum. So now I can get a sense of, okay, this is all colon. Since I'd say a lot of foreign bodies will mimic colon with fecal contents. Uh, then you kind of look at diameters. So ileus, is it functional where everything's kind of the same population, uh, general mild to moderate dilation, or is it a mechanical pattern with uh, a severely distended segment, fairly empty segments, gastric volume and contents. And this is where that history of when was the recent meal, what are they eating, uh, how much were they puking um, comes into play because uh, food just a lot of times isn't distinguishable from some foreign material like cloth or stuffing. Uh, then you look for mass effects, of course, because it's more than just obstructions. Um, so liver size, splenic size, visibility of the dorsal extremity of spleen, cirrhosis of detail, and then just being thorough and assessing everything in the radiograph. So first case is a six-year-old male neutered golden retriever, one day history of vomiting, lethargy, mild diarrhea. So we'll take a look. And if you have questions, um, you can feel free to add them. I'll try to address them as I go, um, or we can just wait till the end. There's, there's time at the end. So in this radiograph, uh, I see kind of a moderately gas dilated stomach. I do see that there is uh, some soft tissue material in here, uh, kind of forming a uh, oblong shape. I have no idea what's going on in the pyloric outflow area because in the BD views, it's gonna be filled with fluid. Uh, I see this intestinal segment that's kind of mildly dilated for small intestines, but easily we know colon's coming up 
somewhere in that vicinity, so possibly the colon. Uh, I don't have a lot of colon, just a little feces back here probably. And then you have these kind of mildly dilated loops, uh, but nothing uh, severely distended. So here we have a right lateral view. So again, you expect that there's going to be fluid opacity, soft tissue opacity in the region of the pyloric antrum on a right lateral view. So I can't interpret too much what's going on in here, but I see mostly kind of just moderate gas dilation. Uh, I do think there's kind of an irregular pattern in the cotoventral intestines, uh, kind of a clumping or bunching of intestines. And so we're going to zoom in on that area. So uh, I think when I look at like what's the sclerosal margins doing, there's a lot of jumps in uh, where I'm seeing sclerosal margins going. It's not a very smooth pattern. Uh, these gas bubbles are a little bit irregular, but they're not by any means the classic uh, comma or irregular shapes. But so there's kind of my interpretation of what some of the irregular margins are doing. But uh, maybe you didn't notice before, but if you look closely, there is a thin line going through these abnormal intestines. So I'd say in a, a good number of dogs, if you look really closely uh, and you have areas of concern for plication, depending on what they ate, you can actually sometimes see the linear form body going through and increasing confidence by a lot because you're like, oh, I see an abnormal line going through. Uh, that doesn't happen very often in cats because they tend to eat something skinnier. So we have that weird area. It's helpful that we see the, the line because we know we're dealing with a linear form body. But what does the left lateral view look like? So if I had seen this view first, I feel like I wouldn't have had to squint and look at the image and you know, try to decide, oh, this kind of collection looks a little weird. It's not super distended. But now in the left lateral view, the antrum is gas filled. And now that material in the stomach is highlighted and it's doing the classic pyloric outflow appearance, which you see a lot where the material is kind of triangulated pointing towards pylorus. So you can tell it's wedged going into pylorus. And uh, you would expect that this was just gastric material, but not uh, causing obstruction. It probably would have fallen away from this area in the left lateral view and gone into the antrum and body. But no, we know it's stuck there because it's defying gravity up at the pylorus. Uh, I, I do think on this left lateral view too, you see that the area of the duodenum now looks kind of irregular and it's, it's much more than that collection of segments uh, in the ventral abdomen. Uh, yep, you're supposed to get the, the slides so you can get those. So, yeah, uh, source of detail near the stomach isn't great. It's also a big dog, so I feel like it can be pretty limited in uh, that area. And I think this is also probably going to be some streaky cloth like form material in the ventral abdomen. Uh, it looks like colon uh, is probably a little emptier but we don't have the pelvic inlet in this image. I don't know if it's there or if I just cut it off, but you can't follow it. So that's one reason why we like to include uh, to the femoral joint area. So yeah, this high level of confidence that you have an anchored foreign body. So, why right versus left lateral and uh, uh, and why are they important one versus the other? So this was a study in veteran ultrasound, 100 dogs prospectively enrolled. They took three view abdomens and they were randomized to either perform the left lateral then the VD and right lateral and then VD views. And they found that actually the order of how you take your three view x-rays are important. So if you take that left lateral view first, you're much more likely to see gas in the antrum as well as duodenum that's going to stick for your VD and right lateral views. And that's very important. So 
not only do you take three views, you want to take your left lateral view first. So left lateral view is very important for vomiting cases. You want to take the left lateral view first, ideally. And your three view studies are going to be extremely helpful to shift gas, highlight different gastrointestinal regions. And um, sometimes you might pick up abdominal masses or foreign bodies much more clear. Uh, I think if in the golden retriever we just saw, if you didn't have the plicated area, you easily could have missed that there was gastric outflow obstruction. So here we have a three-year-old female Great Dane, acute onset of vomiting, regurge, lethargy, abdominal distension. So most people are going to think, oh, big dog, abdominal distension, vomiting, regurge, GDV. Nurses, go get me a right lateral view. And here's what they gave you. So I feel like a lot of these times you do have one right lateral view of just the stomach area, you're missing some of the other parts, but uh, we can still get a lot of information from just the study. So we have this very severe distended stomach. You know it's gonna be a mixture of fluid and gas because you kind of have uh, this gas bubble sitting on top of uh, fluid where stomach comes all the way around, but we know it's not a GDV. Uh, in the right lateral view, you're supposed to get compartmentalization, that Popeye's arm of uh, gas in the antrum that's now displaced dorsally, and it's just not here in this case. Uh, you're not going to make too much interpretation, I think, of, uh, you know, I think you can tell that this looks like fecal material, but you don't know else what else is going on. There's a distended intestinal segment here. Uh, there is some irregular uh, gas bubbles and a small cauda vena cava. So you know something significant is happening. Uh, it just doesn't look like a classic GDV. Then on the ventrodorsal view, uh, severely gas and fluid distended stomach. Uh, it looks like the pyloric antrum is normally where it should be on the right side. And once again, not a lot of information to gain from small intestines, I think, on this study. So they have to go back. Now they have to get their left lateral view. So once again, so in the left lateral view, we have gas going into the uh, pyloric antral region. And we have that same pattern of soft tissue material kind of wedging into the pylorus, sticking to that area, highly indicative of pyloric outflow obstruction. We still have a small cava. Um, in the region of the duodenum, which you expect to kind of come out here. Now I feel like we're starting to get that plicated appearance with uh, teardrop gas bubbles. And so I think this is without a doubt, uh, you know, something that's uh, diagnosable just on radiographs, doesn't need any further imaging uh, and requires exploratory surgery. Uh, going back, just the rest of the belly. We have, you know, gas descended colon, some feces. Uh, this kind of double looped area is probably cecum. Um, you can tell that there's some material ventral here, but there's not a lot of small intestinal distension going on. So this one was obstruction uh, due to pyloric outflow obstruction. We saw it best in the left lateral view. And you could also see that there was duodenoplication. So besides just looking for, you know, outflow obstruction, obvious form material, there's a lot of talk of, you know, measuring things. Uh, I feel like a lot of literature wants to find certain ratios to do, and it just kind of um, can be pretty overwhelming. So um, things that are out there, you do have the the maximum small intestinal diameter to the mid body of L5 ratio. I learned about that one in vet school. Uh, you have the small intestinal max to small intestinal min. That's basically your two populations of intestine where you're looking for a big population, tiny population. And then the max and average, just kind of silly. Um, and then whatever you want. Cats, 
small intestinal maximum to the L2 cranial end plate is what's published just because they want it to be uh, similar to cats and just do what they want. So does measurement of small intestinal diameter increase accuracy of diagnostic radiograph? So we have this measurement, uh, does it help at all? And they were looking specifically in dogs for the small intestinal diameter max to the mid body of L5, since that's what was previously published um, and kind of went off of, uh, you know, I remember in vet school, they said 1.7 was usually highly indicative of obstruction. So they had 37 obstructed dogs, 48 non-obstructed. They were looked at by six observers. And um, using the small intestinal max to L5 ratio, 1.7, their sensitivity and specificity was only 66%. So that's a huge number of animals that you are either going to overcall or undercall as far as being obstructed using that number, which doesn't seem like a very high level of uh, confidence in sending this animal to exploratory uh, or just sitting on it with fluids and or, or sending it home. So in this study, they found that measurements didn't necessarily increase the accuracy for any of the observer, whether it was a radiologist, surgeon, or student. And here's just a slide showing where they met. So the 1.7 is right where sensitivity and specificity meet. So that's probably why, you know, in initial studies, this was kind of the um, cutoff because it's hoping that, you know, it's kind of sweet enough that you're going to be able to diagnose it, but not have a lot of um, false negatives or false positives. When you're getting up into the, you know, the high degree of specificity of yes, this is an obstructed animal, you see that the small intestinal diameter to L5 ratio is generally going to be over the 2, 2.3 sort of range. So um, what about other measurements about the uh, diagnosis of mechanical obstruction? So these looked at 50 dogs with GI signs, the small intestinal max to L5, small intestinal max to min, which is, I think, the, the main thing we look at for mechanical ileus as far as the two populations. And then they looked at small intestinal max to the average measurement. And they did have some uh, kind of helpful conclusions if you, if you like to do measurements as part of your kind of just uh, addition to your assessment. They concluded that uh, very unlikely obstructed is when you have the small intestinal max to mid body L5 ratio less than 1.4, which isn't too far off from the 1.7 that most people might use. Um, and when you're looking at the, the maximum diameter to the minimum diameter, uh, less than two was unlikely obstructed. And then I would just ignore the average because no one's gonna take that much work. So the very likely obstructed cases, that was when the uh, maximum to L5 ratio was more than 2.4. And then when you had the small intestinal max, the small intestinal minimum diameters greater than 3.4. So that means, you know, the small, the biggest one is more than 3.4 times the smallest intestinal diameter. Um, if you had elevated values less than a quarter of the segmental dilation, increased accuracy, because generally that's a more severe uh, discrepancy in population. Uh, but you have so many animals that are going to be between this, between these numbers that are going to um, still require further testing. And when we talk about mechanical ileus and the two populations, it's diameter differences. So uh, how much uh, diameter is in one versus another not fluid content. So it's not the two populations of like, oh, these are gassy, these are fluid filled. That doesn't tend to matter too much. Um, and if you're looking at, you know, the small intestinal max to min, if the biggest intestinal segments aren't more than two times the others, um, you're not technically in the, you know, two populations mechanical ileus sort of range. And then when you do have more than three, you're more likely to be obstructed. And so that's going to probably warrant either, you know, we need to do something about this now, whether it's um, go straight to exploratory, uh, ultrasound to confirm, 
upper GI study. So what about cats? There's not a lot of literature on cats. Uh, you know, so this was looking at 74 cats retrospectively, uh, putting them into the category of normal, non-obstructive, linear foreign body. They chose to go with small intestinal max to L2 uh, ratio of the cranial end plate. Um, they also did L5 cranial end plate, but they, they stuck with L2 as far as their main thing. So they had a ratio of greater than three, um, only a 70% probability obstruction. And it was pretty poor when looking at linear foreign bodies, uh, just because linear foreign bodies tend to be more of a partial obstruction anyway. So it's hard to measure diameters uh, in those cases. So another case, we have two-year-old male neutered mixed breed dog vomiting multiple times for one day, presenting with lethargy. So right away, uh, I have enough abdomen to see rectum into colon, and I can follow colon around. And I know it gets somewhere up into this vicinity. Uh, this is that classic kind of curved cecum shape. I can see pyloric antrum. Pretty confidently, this is duodenum coming around. Uh, there is a mild variation in small intestinal diameters with this probably being your maximum and then your minimum down here. So just highlighting colon, cecum, pylorus, and duodenum. So just for fun, uh, this Montessor max to the mid-body of L5 was 2.1, so quite a bit higher than the uh, uh, 1.7 possible cutoff, uh, but not quite, uh, you know, so certainly that kind of might point to obstruction, but I think looking at these radiographs, there is a, a slight variation, but it's not severe by any means, you know, I think, you know, if you ignore that this one's gas filled and these are fluid filled, you know, it's, it's only one and a half times. So generally for obstruction, you know, more than three times would be what you'd want for a uh, more confident diagnosis. So in this case, I think based off looking at the images, you know, ignoring the measurements, I don't have a high suspicion for obstruction in this case. A lot of times the duodenum does have a larger diameter than the other segments, uh, just because uh, in this case, you know, it's got more gas because we took our left lateral first. And then VD view, we do the same thing. We trace colon up. This is pretty confidently cecum. I can see kind of mild gas dilated stomach. Uh, in this case, you can see more pyloric outflow and then duodenum, but that's pretty much as much as I can interpret in this case. Uh, I don't have a lot of detail of what's going on with the more fluid filled intestines. Um, and then you can assess everything outside of the GI tract. So this one wasn't obstructed and it just had gastroitis. Um, certainly, you know, this is something that you could either treat supportively, do further imaging like IV fluids, repeat radiographs in six to eight hours, or ultrasound wouldn't have been wrong either, just to increase confidence, but that was uh, a gastroitis showing that, you know, sometimes the measurements are misleading when you just use your eyes and kind of look at, you know, there's not a very significant difference in diameter. So another case, we have a three-year-old male neutered Labrador retriever, vomiting pink foam for several hours and palpable abdominal distension. So this is our left lateral view. You can see uh, there is gas in the pyloric antrum, which you would expect based on position, oops, uh, you do see that there's gas dilation of the esophagus, there's uh, displacement of intestines in the craniodorsal abdomen. So unlike that other case of, uh, you know, where it looked like a big dilated stomach uh, on the right lateral view without compartmentalization, so it doesn't look like a classic GDV, you have these displacement of structures that are considered abnormal, like intestines in the dorsal cranial abdomen, you have the esophageal gas dilation. Um, spleen is also doing this kind of reverse 
C appearance, so it's displaced caudally as well as uh, malpositioned. It's not significantly enlarged, but you have this multifocal displacement of structures. And then uh, I just wanted to go back to see that there is this kind of patchy alveolar pattern with some air bronchograms in the region of the right middle lung lobe. So here's your VD view. So, you know, it looks like there's kind of fundus in the right area. I don't see normal pylorus coming off in this image. It's kind of displaced. And things are just out of whack. You have these intestines going cranially. Um, spleen seems like it's just caudally positioned and abnormal. So did we see evidence of outflow obstruction? No, it looked pretty normal. Uh, we don't have severe distension of small intestines. Um, doesn't look like a normal GDV because it doesn't have the normal compartmentalization. But uh, in fact, this was a 360 GDV with aspiration pneumonia. So, uh, you know, looking for that compartmentalization of the antrum, seen the right lateral view. This one kind of was tricking you into thinking that it was normally positioned, uh, but you had this uh, multiple displacement of structures, duodenum, small intestines, you had the esophageal dilation. Um, a lot of times they're gonna be hypovolemic from uh, outflow or from a venous return. And um, clinically you may notice if you tried to pass a stomach tube in this patient, you're gonna meet resistance uh, in diagnosing in this case uh, needs further treatment with surgery. So moving on, we have a one-year-old Labrador retriever who is vomiting. So we can tell colon, normal feces coming through, seems to wrap uh, towards this way. Uh, a lot of times you'll hear the you know, too many colons sort of diagnosis for obstruction. So if you see something that looks like colon, but there's another thing that looks like colon, but it uh, doesn't seem like it lines up appropriately. Um, this one I think is a little trickier because you have this kind of uh, more streaky material rather than the formed feces, uh, but it's kind of in an area where ascending colon could live. You have these moderately dilated small intestinal segments, and they're doing, uh, you know, pretty active peristalsis. You see that they're uh, distended and then actively contracting down into these kind of bean tamale sort of shapes because um, they're they're working pretty hard. So once again, we can see colon coming up, uh, kind of mild to moderate small intestinal dilation. I can't see that other streaky area on this view just because we're looking at a big dog and uh, there's just not that great of detail. So we have colon, looks like it's going like that. That's our abnormal area that's trying to trick you into think it's colon. And then you have these hyperperistalactic segments. Just for fun, I looked at max, in, uh, max diameter to L5 height and it was in that 1.7 ratio, which I think doesn't instill a lot of confidence in what to do with this case next. So what they did with this case is they kept it on fluids, uh, then they decided to recheck radiographs. So I think on the initial study, uh, you know, you have this kind of mild mixed population, you have hyperperistalsis, like the intestines are trying to push something out but uh, having trouble. Um, so certainly this is a case where I think you should have been concerned about, you know, something doesn't seem right. Uh, the two colons look to it. But after fluids, so now I think this is going to be that uh, streaky material that we saw before. Now looks like it's in plane with the colon. Also notice that there's improved small intestinal distension. So what was in the small intestines with fluids was able to pass into the colon. Here's the VD view. So this ended up being a sock. So you can see that kind of striated pattern with the foreign material and uh, pretty easy to follow 
colon, realize it's in colon, we seek them up here. Okay, so our next case is a three-year-old cat, vomiting, lethargy, and abdominal pain. So we do have uh, thorax abdomen series. Um, normally, I definitely look at the, the chest and everything beforehand, but uh, I didn't put any secret things in these cases for you. So we can have this kind of moderate gas dilated stomach. Um, you can tell that there's a lot of curvature to the gas bubbles uh, when you're trying to follow serosal margins. Uh, they just don't seem to want to stick to a normal, you know, curved, comfortable path. So this looks pretty concerning for uh, intestinal plication. Uh, same thing with a lot of these, although this is not the normal cat way of wanting to do plication. This is kind of the dog plication where you have these big loops, uh, teardropped, curved gas bubbles. Um, so I see this pattern much more frequently in dogs. So there's kind of our linear appearance. Uh, you know, this big gastable loop seems like it wants to be colon on the VD view, but once again, you have this kind of multifocal, uh, irregular plicated appearance, mild to moderately gas dilated stomach. But once again, a lot of these things that look like linear form bodies or are linear form bodies, they are partial obstructions. You don't expect to see, you know, big segmental distension. Uh, but I wanted to hone in. Um, so in this right caudal abdomen, you have this segment here, uh, void of gas, but generally looks thickened and has a pretty irregular serosal margin. This is the more normal, typical cat plication appearance where you get this kind of crunchy serosal look uh, because cats like to eat much finer linear foreign bodies, string, dental floss, you know, it's not like rope toys uh, like, or, you know, rags like dogs tend. So they plicate very tightly and get this irregular serosal margin. So this one did have linear foreign body under the tongue. It went all the way from uh, through the stomach and colon had multiple areas of erosion. And a lot of times, um, even with perforated uh, linear foreign bodies, you don't see septic peritonitis just because uh, that plication is so tight, even though it's eaten through the intestine, it's kind of sealing itself off. And I, even on ultrasound, it's very challenging to see a perforation in linear foreign bodies just because it's kind of sealing itself off. You're not going to get free gas very commonly. Um, so just be aware, uh, once you get in surgery, start loosening things up, you might see more preparations than what was expected. So just kind of going through a bunch of different cases with little things to highlight. So a three-year-old cat, vomiting, lethargy, fever. So colon is pretty easy to see. Gas form feces, loops around here. And ascending colon uh, only looks like a mildly dilated stomach. Um, seems like there's kind of an irregular concentration of intestines in the right caudal abdomen. Uh, when you look closely, there's these multiple uh, little teardrop shapes. So certainly I think um, even though you don't have much distension, uh, I don't like these gas bubbles. So I think it probably would warrant some further investigation. Um, once again, in the VD view, just that irregular collection of material, not much distension elsewhere in the GI tract. So this is a case I would recommend ultrasound to look for. Uh, you can diagnose linear form body with, uh, you know, barium series. Um, they're not the best cases for, you know, giving them fluids and just rechecking because you always worry about, you know, sitting on those and uh, increased risk of perforation. So 
this case tricked me. Um, it looked pretty concerning for foreign body, just ended up to be corrugation. So that's just kind of highlighting that, um, you know, in subtle cases like this, um, which sometimes is all you get with linear foreign body, is just have that air caution that intestinal corrugation might cause those same irregularities uh, that you would see. So unless you saw, you know, really uh, multiple areas of bunched up crunched intestines, sometimes you might see the linear foreign body, or if you had the left lateral that showed foreign material in the pylorus, those could increase your suspicion. So next one, two-year-old cat, fishing line hanging out of its mouth. Um, owner's son pulled on it, but felt resistance. That sounds pretty scary. So I think you're gonna have linear foreign body plication on your mind in this case. And this cat is following the rules. So it's taking that little piece of string and decided to bunch the intestines together, make them look thick with a very crunchy, irregular, uh, kind of like an, a collapsed accordion sort of appearance. Uh, so this is the most classic type of um, cat linear form body that I see. I don't tend to see a lot of the teardrops all the time, but cats like to do this sort of pattern where you just have that irregular, crunchy intestines. So, um, one thing to keep in mind when you're looking at intestinal bunching. So these are lateral radiographs from two different cats. At first glance, they look pretty similar, uh, but uh, the one here is a cat with linear foreign body. So you can tell it's thickened when you follow the serosal margin. It, it looks pretty irregular and jumpy. When you look at the other case, which is just a normal fat cat, I can follow pretty smooth serosal margins. It's not uh, you know, that irregular crunchy serosa, but also you have this bunching where intestines tend to be concentrating um, into the mid ventral abdomen, making it look abnormal. But just remember that fat cats like to concentrate intestines into the right mid ventral abdomen. So um, looking at that serosal margin is pretty key. So one-year-old cat, multiple episodes of vomiting with uh, anorexia. So uh, in this cat, pretty moderately gas and fluid dilated stomach, uh, colon comes about to this point and then uh, becomes a little harder to follow. Like, does it loop around? Uh, you have this segment, which is kind of uh, mildly fluid dilated, which seems possibly small intestine, kind of could be colon, but and then you have these more small, normal, very mildly fluid filled loops. Same thing on the venture dorsal view, mild to moderately gas fluid dilated stomach. Uh, these segments are not severely dilated relative to these, but seem slightly mixed. And then we can see colon coming around, losing it probably in about this area. So just kind of a close up of uh, stomach. So, you yeah, have moderate gastric gas and fluid distension, not severe intestines. So certainly I think, you know, this looks like it could be gastritis with maybe slightly asymmetric function ileus, um, or maybe it's an aura at obstruction because you don't see a lot of small intestinal distension. Um, certainly partial obstructions are always the bane of our existence because they're gonna let fluid pass. They won't give you that distension, um, or it could be kind of early in the stage of complete. So what next steps could you do? Certainly you can do medical management, hydrate them, recheck radiographs six to eight hours. Uh, if you have ultrasound, uh, ultrasound is always gonna be more uh, sensitive and specific for obstruction. A lot of studies say you know, it's about 100% um, or pretty close to that with someone skilled in ultrasound. Or you can do an upper GI barium study. Uh, 
And in this case, calculated our options. What does a scientist's dog do with bones? Very, um, so we went with the upper GI. So just talking about uh, upper GI barium studies in general, uh, some of the cons, it can be kind of time and labor intensive because you're taking uh, multiple views at kind of initially small intervals increasing. Um, there's always the risk of aspiration of barium, which is concerning. They can be messy, get barium on your x-ray table, which isn't good. Uh, barium and peritoneum aren't good friends, so increased risk of uh, adhesions or peritonitis. Uh, tricky to interpret, certainly I think, uh, you know, you have a study with nine to 15 x-rays that you're trying to interpret uh, and you're looking for uh, subtleties that uh, just can be tricky. Um, and it's a lot of, a lot of x-rays to take both for, uh, you know, the pet radiation as well as the staff trying to assist in those radiographs. But the pros of it are, you know, generally it's going to be cheaper than eight hours of hospitalization or going to ultrasound. Um, most patients will have barium available and it is known to be effective in diagnosing obstructions. Um, certainly the partial obstruction can be complicated. Um, a lot of times when you do delayed views of uh, barium series, you might see barium imprinting on that foreign body, like if it's in the stomach or small intestine, um, holding on to it so that you can identify it, even if all the barium has been able to get past it. So a little note about GI studies, uh, in case you haven't used these very much, um, you wanna use 30% barium weight per volume uh, with, mixed with water. If you're doing an esophagram, uh, that's going to be 50 to 60 percent. Oh, sorry, ORAD obstruction. Uh, I tend to like to do, um, instead of proximal and distal in the GI tract, ORAD just being more, uh, you know, either probably duodenum or uh, pyloric outflow. Whereas, like, if you have like a mid or aboral or further away from the mouth, mid or distal jejunum to ilium. The question was, what is an ORAD obstruction? So in esophagrams, you wanna use more concentrated barium so that it sticks to the esophageal mucosa better. But for GI studies, the 30% uh, weight for volume, you need survey radiographs the day of the study. So if you have x-rays from the night before and they come back in for a GI study, you need to take survey radiographs uh, right before you administer the barium. Oral gastric tube is ideal to get the total volume into the stomach. Um, and you wanna make sure that uh, you actually do have an oral gastric tube and not oral bronchus. Um, so you either add a little bit of water to check or radiograph would be great. You can syringe feed barium, higher risk of aspiration. Uh, if they won't let you pass the tube. If you do have to use sedatives, um, ideally no sedation, but because uh, you're going to affect GI motility a little bit. Uh, the studies that did look at it found that ACE Torb in dogs was generally uh, easy to use and didn't affect GI motility. And then Ket Val or Ket Ace in cats if you want to use sedation. What's the dosing? So large dogs use a smaller mil per kg dose of about 10 to 12 mils per kg. Small dogs and cats, more like 15 to 20 mils per kg. And the dosing is very important because if you skimp on the dose, it ruins pretty much the rest of your study. The number one mistake that you can see is people don't get enough barium into the animal and you don't get enough gastric distension. Well, that's gonna have a huge effect on gastrointestinal emptying and small intestinal transit time. So I listed the kind of transit times for barium to reach the duodenum, jejunum, and colon, um, and then the full transfer of everything from the stomach, small intestines, and into colon. The one that, if you had to, measure, to memorize one area, it's the time to colon. So that's small intestinal transit time, um, just because you, it's probably, you're probably not going to be able to memorize every single number, but 
to know that when does the barium reach the colon? Two hours in the dog, one hour in the cat. So back to our cat vomiting gastric distension. We have survey radiographs followed by administration of barium. So, so now once we added a barium, now we have severe gastric distension. This is the right lateral view. So you expect all the, the barium and fluid to go into the pyloric outflow tract. You can see some thin rugal folds. Um, it hasn't quite gotten into the small intestines yet. This is also at minute zero. So by the time that we got our BD view, now we have a little bit of duodenal filling. Cats, it's usually kind of an instantaneous thing. So 20 minutes, you know, still on the path, we have small intestinal filling. Uh, it does seem like there's a rather abrupt uh, obstruction in the contrast or uh, where it stops and you have this linear defect. 20 minutes, maybe it should be a little bit further than this, but you're gonna wanna do your 60 minute images to confirm, but pretty distended small intestinal segment got right into the ORAD jejunum or beginning of the jejunum. And after an hour, it hasn't progressed. So now we know that by an hour in the cat, it should be all the way in the colon, um, and it definitely did not make it there. So now we've diagnosed obstruction with a high level of confidence in this cat. Uh, this family happened to have kids. So this was a Nerf bullet, which I feel like this is a very common uh, cause of obstruction in cats, uh, which is just kind of silly because it looks like it should be able to just squeeze on by, but nope, that's not the case. Um, not as sad as the almond though. Cats and almonds don't mix. It's the saddest little foreign body, but cats just like to obstruct on them. So another case, 14 year old, male neuter domestic short hair, four days of anorexia, lethargy and vomiting. We have a question for barium studies. Do you take a single lateral and VD each time and need three view each time segment? So ideally you do three views. Um, in the beginning, I've seen people use like 15 minutes in the beginning. So it's good to have, I think the three views initially. Um, and then once you get past the 30 minute mark and jump to the 60 minute mark, sometimes then they might just choose to do uh, lateral and VD. Uh, but I'd say for the first two series, the zero, 20 minutes, uh, use three views would be ideal. And our 14 year old cat was also ictric on exam. So here on our lateral view, uh, stomach looks kind of, you know, mild fluid dilation, but not significant. Um, we can follow colon from rectum. Uh, looks like it's coming around into about this area. Mild small intestinal dilation, um, gas and fluid. But I think what really stands out in this case is this mid-abdominal loss of serosal detail. And also has a feature that um, radiologists just like to pick up on is that it's not the, I have a little bit of ascites transitate fluid that just kind of loses detail or when you just have some uh, mesenteric edema or like mild inflammation, it has this more uh, modeled, irregular, uh, slightly like kind of thick nodular looking mesentery. So when you get into this modeled category, uh, usually it jumps in severity to either, you know, more frequently more of a severe peritonitis, whether it's sterile from pancreatitis or septic peritonitis or something like a carcinomatosis likes to form these uh, modeled characteristics. So uh, looking at GI tract, stomach still seems pretty empty. Um, you have mild small intestinal gas dilation with some empty segments, but does not fit the criteria for 
you know, significant two populations of intestines. The other thing that is nice about cats is, especially when they're fat, they will show you left lobe of pancreas. So it kind of looks like this flag coming up uh, by the greater curvature of stomach, your spleen and left kidney. This is pretty big. Usually it should just be like, you know, a little smooth tail. This one looks thick. You can appreciate that it also has this irregular appearance. And now on the VD view, you can appreciate that that kind of mottled peritoneal appearance seems very concentrated around pancreas and that cranial abdomen, not so much around these intestines, but definitely around pancreas. Uh, you do kind of get this uh, slight faint increased opacity too, um, almost you know, wanting to hover around mineral, but not super dense mineral specks. So you have this uh, marked pancreatic thickening, irregular margin, uh, and then you have this modeling of the intestines. So do you just have severe pancreatitis and peritonitis, which looks possible in this cat, or could it be pancreatic neoplasia and carcinomatosis causing this? And in this cat, it ended up being a pancreatic carcinoma. So um, if you had more discrete mineral, I think that always increases the concern for carcinoma in the pancreas. Uh, but in this case, I think it was pretty faint and subtle. Uh, but just kind of hitting back that, you know, that modeled appearance generally adds more concern than just oh, a little inflammation, uh, edema, or ascites. So I threw in some kind of random slides because I just wanted to see uh, some other uh, not full studies, but characteristics that can be important for diagnosing obstructions. So uh, this dog, you know, you can see colons up here separate. And then you have this dilated segment with kind of streaky material. And you also have wispy mineral mixed in. Obviously, you have uh, a baby in the house because there's a pacifier, but maybe you don't always have this radiopaque material. But when you see this kind of settled mineral debris, uh, that tends to be the gravel sign that's going to hint more towards a, a chronic partial obstruction. So, so this was able to allow, you know, probably fluid to pass, but the non-digestible bits like to accumulate. So gravel sign with chronic partial obstruction. The other thing I added is um, a lot of times people be like, oh, the intestines look stacked and they're trying to use that as like a, you know, a, a Röntgen sign to look for obstruction. And just keep in mind that, you know, once you get the true stacking, it means you have severe dilation of intestines where they're just completely running out of room and having to loop back on themselves. So um, a lot of times when people say, oh, it looks kind of stacked, it's usually just like one or two areas, but it's probably just the natural curve of the intestines. This is an obstructed case where you have, you know, severe dilation, multiple stacking in multiple directions. So this is more of the, the stacked appearance that you expect when people say obstruction. And this one definitely has severe uh, mixed population of severe distension and then pretty empty mildly gas dilated loops. So next case, we have a three-year-old Great Dane, two episodes of vomiting today, one episode of water diarrhea, had a prophylactic gastrovexy. So this is our right lateral view, um, kind of moderate gastric distension. The uh, thing that stands out the most is probably the severe colon distension. It's coming around and then here you have cecum. Uh, certainly it's not abnormal to see severely gas descended uh, colons with uh, colitis, gastroenteritis. A lot of the small intestines look kind of mildly gas dilated, but certainly fits more of the functional ileus pattern. And you do have kind of a small cava, so it seems like there's some uh, possible hypovolemia involved. Although if you only see it in one lateral view, we always say, you know, certainly it could just be respiratory or cardiac phase variation. Uh, detail isn't great, but it's a great Dane. So that's kind of always a concern of like, 
just being such a large animal that you know you have to kind of take sterosa detail in the thicker parts with a grain of salt. So kind of just the rest of the belly because it's such a big dog, but we know that it is colon, severely gas dilated, coming around, and then cecum here. So here we have a ventrodorsal view and a dorsal ventral view. I'll let you guys look at that for a second. You can kind of tell we always hate DV abdomen views because they are so, they scrunch up and basically you're saying like any source of detail I could have possibly seen is now gone because they're just scrunching up. So DV views are kind of always very challenging, but uh, certainly it's better than nothing if you feel like it's an animal that won't go on its back. Um, so when we try to follow colon, I think now we have a pretty uh, concerning appearance, even though on the lateral view, it kind of looked like it was probably just gas dilated. But now we have this kind of, you know, C-shaped structure, um, which is kind of at the right level, but totally the wrong side. So cecum, we would prefer to be over here, kind of right mid-abdomen. Looks like cecum is now on the left side with this kind of um, odd appearance to the colon. And it was persistent on the D DV. So I had this case on call, the ER called me when I was a first year resident and they're like, hey, what do you think of this case? You know, big colon. Uh, I was like, I think that's a, that looks like a clonic torsion. And the ER was like, no, the dog's super comfortable. The lactate was normal. And it was like 2 a.m. And I'm like, that looks like a clonic torsion. Let me come in and do a very minima. They did not want me to do a very minima. They're like, no, we can't do it. It's a Great Dane, there's not enough help. So what ended up happening was they just kept that animal comfortable for the next couple hours and then transferred it. And then we did a uh, very minute uh, in the morning. So these are the survey radiographs the next day. So now I feel like we have colon. Why is it tapering here and then getting bigger? So now I'm like, oh, they didn't let me do an enema last night. So now I'm worried it's, it waited all this time. We did our full survey. So cecum was here, uh, still kind of in that same spot. So how do you do a very minimal? Generally, uh, you're doing a bigger volume. So, you know, 25% barium sulfate is what's recommended. Foley catheter, uh, very gentle. Uh, my residency director was helping with this and he was just you know, saying, oh, gentle, 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 gentle. He was so scared about ripping something because uh, just, I don't know, out of concern. But so here you have the barium into the rectum and colon, and then it's giving you this very nice kind of spiraled appearance that you'd expect with either uh, you know, with sort of a torsion or volvulus in multiple areas, whether it's uh, you know, that swirl sign on ultrasound for mesenteric volvulus, or in this case, you know, that's a pretty abnormal appearance. And we didn't want to put too much resistance to go past there. And then the oblique view just showing the same thing. So we don't see colon torsions too often. And I, you know, but I've seen several now in my career. And surprisingly, they don't tend to come in as that, like, like a mesenteric volvulus would where they're dying and super shocky. Um, you know, they tend to be kind of just like having diarrhea, mildly uncomfortable. Um, Cause I, I was surprised when I palpated the dog that had the colon torsion that we did, you could pretty much palpate the belly and get your fingers together. Like it seemed pretty comfortable once it was on fluid and it had some pain meds on board. So there's just not a lot of research on them, but this was a case series of just six dogs. They were, uh, the results tended to show that this was uh, large breed dogs, non-specific gastrointestinal signs. Um, a big thing, most of these dogs had a history of prior gastropexy, which could just be uh, coincidental that large breed dogs get pexy. Although a few of them did seem like the colon had kind of hung up at the 
PEXI site. So um, if you have a big dog, history of PEXI, colon torsion should be uh, kind of on your mind. Uh, just because early recognition is going to be important because, you know, certainly necrosis of the colon could be super crazy. So next case, this is a four-year-old male neuter dachshund, one and a half days of vomiting, history of a protein losing nephropathy. So here's our VD view. I'm sure most of you picked up that something is in the stomach, this big round soft tissue opacity. Could it be a glob of food? Well, it doesn't look uh, stippled like food would be. Uh, it looks more solid. It's not perfectly round like a ball. Um, and then following gas, you have quite a bit of gas in this area of the stomach. I don't see um, antrum gas filled, but it could just be fluid filled, but it seems like there's kind of some intestines coming up in this area. Here's the VD view. So certainly we know there's something weird going on with the stomach. It looks like a big intraluminal structure, soft tissue opacity, uh, concern for you know, foreign material. Um, this case, you know, maybe you can figure it out based on these, seeing how the stomach looks. Maybe you want more info, um, ultrasound, or in this case, they did a gastrogram. So in this one, they did some barium and also instilled some mixed air at the same time. So DV view, VD view, um, you know, once again, multiple views, it's just shifting gas and fluid. And you can see that there is a big difference in uh, what you tend to see. So in the DV view, um, you can see kind of this uh, almost rugal fold appearance you lose that on the VD view. So I feel like, uh, but you do have this uh, area of filling defect on the VD view. It's a much larger filling defect and the contrast is seemed to have pulled somewhere centrally. So once again, you have um, the central filling defect. It keeps having this kind of striated rugal fold appearance, but certainly now, where, why is the, everything kind of concentrated in this area? I never see a good uh, pyloric outflow area. And that's because pylorogastric, gastrogastric into susception. So uh, not something you see every day, but I've seen several. This patient underwent general anesthesia for exploratory laparotomy. Unfortunately, the interception did spontaneously resolve, but then they were able to uh, pexy the animal. So this study was looking at endoscopic diagnosis of pylorogastric interception. Uh, this was a young female golden retriever. This patient just had acute vomiting. Um, they could. This one also had spontaneous resolution on exploration of the abdomen. And there was no primary cause. So um, they're not always going to be the parasitic ridden dogs or, um, you know, I don't necessarily know that the PLN had anything to do with the uh, interception in our case. But just kind of a fun thing that uh, you may see. And then here's the case from that paper where it kind of has that same appearance that you have this uh, gas-filled fundic area. You never quite see any sort of antrum. It seems kind of cut. And then this big round structure within the stomach wall. So that's all the cases I have for you. Uh, thanks for staying here with me. So what are the takeaways? Three view abdomen radiographs are best. And we do know that the order does matter. So the left ladder view first is gonna help you see the duodenum and antrum in the subsequent images. Uh, generally, 
you know, don't get too hung up on the vertebral body ratios. I think if you go back to the roots of two populations where you have the maximum and minimum diameter and just looking for those two populations is going to be the most helpful in determining obstructions. You got to be thorough and systematic. So, um, you know, look at everything outside the image. Um, please include the pelvis, please collimate. And barium is not dead. It can still be useful, even if you have, uh, if you don't have ultrasound available. A lot of times I think um, ultrasound replaces what would be a upper GI study, but uh, it still has its place and owners are still going to look for them.